Hey there fellow marketers, Professor Walters here, and today we're going to start our topic on service marketing. Because what you have to realize is marketing of services like financial services, right? Like selling your accounting services or your financial advising or, or educational services like a degree. They're very different than marketing a product. I mean, because think about it. With a phone, I can market the speed, I can market the nice colorful screen, the pictures you can take. Oh, look, it plays the newest Angry Birds, right? You can talk about those kind of things. You can see those things. I can taste, taste it, touch it, feel it. You can do all of those things with a product. But service is very different. And we have videos that will go through the differences between products and services. But in general, what you have to realize is service is the driving force behind the U.S. economy. It's over 75% of the U.S. economy is driven by services, financial services, medical services, educational services, legal services, all those kind of things. That's what's driving the economy. That's why when the coronavirus hit, you had all the crashes in the stock market because people were no longer going out to buy services. I wasn't going to watch that movie. I didn't want to go to class. I didn't want to get up my hit up my CPA to do my taxes. I didn't want to get out. And therefore people were not going in using those services. So the impact on the economy was it's like outstandingly horrible because of that. And the stock market reflected that how it went down. But the thing is, is when we're looking at marketing our services, what we have to realize is when you're marketing your services, it's kind of like marketing retail. It's more about the experience. I mean, think about it. The service of going to an amusement park or the server like yeah, going to Disney World or Six Flags or something like that. It's not necessarily the ride itself. It's the feeling you get. It's the experience you have there. And so we have this issue that, look, we got to get people to understand our experience of our service so they know that our experience is better. Because think about it. If you look at education, I mean, there's a lot of universities now that are going online. Well, the thing is, is a lot of them are using the same textbook. So if they're all using the same textbook, shouldn't it be the same educational service every time? Well, no. There's the delivering of the education, right? That can be very different. And I'm sure a lot of you are taking online classes and you're seeing that difference of having an online class versus a face-to-face -face thing. I know for me, the delivering of my service, of my education to my students who are usually right here with me. Mr. Caroline, miss you guys. Hope you're doing okay, CJ. Thinking of you, buddy. And you, what, what you end up having is it's a very different experience, right? And so the service is very different. Because when you really think about it, a lot of it comes down to perspective. If we're looking at service experiences, I know I have friends of mine that are surgeons, right? And they'll do the exact same surgery on two different people, and they'll be like, hey, I think this surgery went great. And one person's like, oh, this is awesome. The other person's like, I'm gonna sue you for malpractice because my knee doesn't work as well. I mean, I've had doctors that go in like, look, this person can't walk, and they give them a new knee, and they're like, they can walk again. They're like, thank you, doctor, this is wonderful. Thank you so much. And other people, they can't walk, they get them a good knee, and they're like, oh, I expected I'll be able to jump super high again, and I can't, so this service was bad. I mean, that's the thing you're looking at in service marketing. It's really hard to kind of compare those things. Look at you and your friends. I mean, how many of you have a favorite movie that your friends don't like? Again, marketing of movies, of services, and stuff like that can be very difficult because there's different perspectives people have, different kinds of ideas of their experiences. So what ends up happening in service marketing, we start to focus more on customer relationships necessarily than like a product kind of thing. Because you know, you might identify with your Samsung phone, right? But or your iPhone or something like that, but it's the relationships you have in service market that gets you to go back. I go back to my same accountant, Anita. I love her to death. She's awesome. She's helped me out for years. And I go back to because we have a relationship. I don't have to explain to her, well, you know, we traveled about 20 countries a year, so we have 20 different currencies and all these kind of things. And of course, we have to do the tax deductions for the travel and this kind of stuff. She's like, oh, yeah, I got it, no problem. So tell me the, the number for that, that country and we'll, we'll figure it out from there. No problem. If I go to a new CPA, it's like, oh, you travel? Yeah, do you travel very much? Uh, kind of. You start to see, it's like, look, I want to develop that service relationship. I want to have that because I go back. It's why when you look at your restaurants, you go back to your favorite restaurant. Why? Is it the best food ever? Maybe, but probably not the best food you ever had in your life, but you enjoy the experience when you're there and the relationships you have with people. And that's why in service marketing, we really focus on that. Now, if I look at kind of different types of service marketing, one kind of thing you probably used to see is what we call external service marketing. And this is when the company itself is marketing to their customers. We're talking about the price and the products we have and the services we offer and things like that. We're marketing these kind of things to you, the customer, right? And that's more of the traditional kind of marketing. But the thing is you gotta realize, service marketing isn't just for people outside. It's also for people inside. And you have what's called internal service marketing, okay? 
think about it. Have you ever had a job that actually marketed to you? I know for me, during the football season where I work, the, the university markets to the professors and the staff, hey, why don't you come to the football game this weekend? Hey, we can get you cheap tickets. Hey, four for 44. They have all this kind of stuff where they're actually marketing to us. But I'm like, I already work for you. Why are you marketing to me? Because sometimes you do want to do internal service marketing, letting people know, hey, we have a talk on retirement planning. Hey, we have a talk on how to plan online classes. So they're actually marketing their services internally. I know one of my favorite internal marketing things is when companies are, are, are marketing to students and stuff like that, or interns that come and they have like big barbecues to make them feel like more welcome and stuff like that. That's what we're talking about, this internal service market. We're just trying to show, look, we're not just taking care of people outside the firm, we're also marketing to you inside the firm. Hence why you have people going, I-L-L, I-N-I, -I. yeah, we can do it together, let's go team. You have those kind of things, all right? Now, there's also what we call interactive service marketing. This is when you're going to the store and the customer is interacting with the employee versus the company doing its kind of promotion kind of stuff, its marketing kind of thing overall. This is actually that one-on-one. -on -one. That's that personal selling kind of stuff where you have the interaction between the client and the employee. And that's why it's really important that you train your employees, your service employees, how to deal with your customers, how to work with your customers. I mean, we travel a lot and I've been impressed. I've seen some really pissed off people at the airport and the Delta agents Thank you very much, sir. I hope you have a great day. I'm sorry we have these issues. How can I help out? Like they're so calm, they're so cool, they're so chill, even though people are like, I missed my flight, what's going on? And they're like, well, let's see what we can do, sir. Here we go, I can get you another flight to Atlanta. Like, and I'm like, dang, how do they do that? It's because they've been trained to interact with upset clients and that really helps. Because if you don't know what to do, it's like, I don't know what I'm gonna do here. It's like babysitting for the first time or having a kid for the first time, you're like, what do I do with this thing? I don't know, it's crying, do I, I, I can't give it milk, I don't know what to do. You know, but you know, after a couple of kids, you're like, oh yeah, yeah, the baby's crying, yeah, it's, it's either one, it's got a dirty diaper, two, it's tired, or three, it's hungry. So, check, <laughs> you know, you're like, oh, I got it now. Because I've been trained, my wife trained me, my parents trained me, my kids trained me. You have that so you can have kind of better interactive service marketing. So I hope this helps you understand overall just like, what service marketing is, it is the selling and marketing of educational services, financial services, legal services, medical services, any kind of services out there, you know, your garbage service, this kind of stuff, that's what it is. So I wish you all the best and um, if you have any comments or questions or anything like that, leave them in the comments section below. We really appreciate your comments, likes, subscriptions, all that kind of fun stuff and I wish you all the best. Bye. Hey there fellow marketers, Professor Walters here and today we're here in Paris and today we're going to talk about are the differences between service marketing and product marketing because the marketing of services is different than the marketing of products for a lot of different reasons and I'm really going to focus on four of the different kind of key aspects of a service in terms of how they're different than a product. I mean one, they're intangible. You can't actually hold a service. Like I can hold my phone in my hand but how do you hold your education? I mean you can't really hold it, right? So you have that. So a second way that that actually differs is the inseparable nature of services. Like if I want to get a haircut, you know, on the sides, I have to be there to have it done. You can't have a service and not be there, all right? Now, a third way that you see that they're actually different is the perishable nature of services. I can't use yesterday's plane ticket to fly back to Chicago because it doesn't exist anymore, all right? And then the fourth way you look at it is the variability of services. You Every time you get a service, it can be different. You know, you might go to the same restaurant twice and have completely different experiences. And so what we're going to do is go through these four ways they're different and really give you ways that you need to focus as marketers in terms of how to deal with these differences, okay? If you think about it in terms of the intangible nature of services, when you go to a restaurant, you can eat the food, it's in your mouth, you can taste it, feel it, smell it, oh, enjoy it, all kinds of great stuff. But the service is something that can be different. That's something you can't hold on to because, I mean, if you hold on to your waiter, you're going to have some problems, right? So you have to think about that. So our problem as marketers is how do we make the intangible nature of services more tangible? How do we make it so people can kind of understand what they're going to be getting? And so what we do is we actually use cues in order to inform consumers. So if you think about it, we might show for a for a Six Flags or Disney World Paris or something like that, we'll show families having a good time. Look at them, yay! They're having so much fun. Yes, you can't hold that fun, but you can see people 
having fun and that can cue you that this could be a fun time. Another thing you might look at is how at the atmosphere might help or hinder your ability to market your service. That's why when you see all those law firms on TV when they're selling their law services, they're always in their suit and ties and they're on their phone right away and they've got that wall of library books or of, of law books behind them to show how smart they are, right? We're trying to let you know that look, the atmosphere here is professional. So we'll be professional when we work on your case, right? And so that's what they're doing. And another thing you might see is companies will actually use images to show the benefit or the value of their services. That's why you see a lot of like accounting firms and consulting firms will sponsor golfers. I mean, think about it. All golf is is hitting a ball with a stick. Anybody can hit a ball with a stick, just like anyone can count two plus two, but it takes someone truly exceptional to hit that ball with a stick way better. Just like it takes someone exceptionally good to count two plus two better for you for your taxes, right? So we're trying to show a lot of different things about our services, though even though people can't hold on to the service because the intangible nature, they can understand better what they're getting. Okay, now the second thing we talked about is the inseparable nature of services. The person receiving the service has to be there for that service to be there. Like, I have to be there to get my hair cut, right? Okay, so you have to think about that. But the thing is, it's very difficult for consumers to try out services beforehand. Like, if you ever wanted to get a, a haircut, you know, and you're like, well, I don't know what I'm gonna look like. And so you like try different ways. Like, what would I look like if I dyed my hair? What would I look like if I shaved my head? I mean, I know what it looks like, you know, with no hair here, but what about on the side? I don't know. And therefore you don't go for the service. And so what you'll see is sometimes companies use technology so you can see what you look like in these glasses on all the different sides or what you might look like with different haircuts or we might just try to lower their overall risk. So we might say, look, your first month is free. Think about Netflix, Hulu, all those kind of subscription services. It's always like, well, your first month is free and then you can decide if you like it and stay on because they're just trying to get people to try the service out for that first time. And so that's why guarantees are gonna be very important for this inseparable nature. So people know that, look, if you don't like it, it's gonna be okay because it really is difficult for consumers to truly like judge the benefits of a service without actually having it. But I don't wanna have the benefits of of shaving my head unless I really know it's gonna look okay on me or I'm gonna just look like a big bowling ball on top of my head right so you got to think about that and so what's helpful here this is where social media has become a lot more helpful for service marketing is you're gonna see reviews from other customers sharing their experiences using these services are gonna be very helpful that's why if you're looking at a hotel stays you read the reviews to see what was the service like there how was your experience sleeping at that hotel so you have a better idea because I can look and see hey there was a family staying there with with small children this is their experience I have a better idea of how that service is going to work now the third thing you're gonna see that's different between services and products is the variability I mean think about it when you go to McDonald's around the world you get the same cheeseburger the same Big Mac everywhere that's why tourists like McDonald's because they know what they're gonna get every single time but with services that variability means you don't know if you're gonna get the same service every single time because I've been to some McDonald's that were spotless clean and were a great experience and I've been other ones where I thought my kids might get some kind of disease from the play area okay so you really got to think about these things so what can we do to kind of reduce the variability of our services so one thing you see with fast food places you'll see if you go through the drive-thru they have a little screen there that puts up what all your order what you order and they ask hey is everything on the screen correct they're using that technology to make sure the service stays consistent everyone gets everything they order right we use that technology to help us out also going along with that automation can help as well I mean think about it when you go to the ATM it doesn't matter where you are in the world you can pretty much figure out the ATM the automation side of it makes it a lot easier than trying to figure out which exchange house I can go exchange my dollars for euros for I'm not sure which one has the best rate I'm just going to go to the ATM it's automated I'll take care of it that way okay also, what helps is a lot of training. You want to make sure everyone knows when they say that we have kick butt service here. Well, what is kick butt service? What does that mean? Oh, it means that you're visiting their table every two minutes. If their glass is under half full, you need to fill it up. You're going to ask them how they are at least seven times. Whatever it means, you train people so they're always delivering that same consistent service no matter who is the waiter that day or the salesperson that day. So we really do need to spend some money to kind of decrease that variability because it is one of those things that people, if they go to a restaurant once and it's a great experience, they go to it a second time, it's a bad experience. What is that restaurant? Is it good? Is it bad? Is it somewhere in the middle? I don't know, but I do know if I've got an important dinner with my boss or my girlfriend or my wife or whatever, I'm not going to take them there because I can't take a chance. It's going to be bad. I just want to know I'm going to go someplace that's consistent. And the last way that services and products are different is services are perishable. You can't 
services don't last. You can't store hotel rooms, stays in, in, in the back office. No, you can only have last night's, you know, hotel room could have only been used last night. Tonight's hotel room can only be used tonight, okay? So you have to sell it when you can because you can't sell anything that's left. There's no inventory to sell because you, you can't sell back inventory because it doesn't exist. It's impossible. We do not have time travel right now, okay? Because if you think about it, all those hotel rooms we didn't sell, all those train tickets we didn't sell, all those airplane tickets we didn't sell for all those flights, all those trains, all those hotels yesterday, that's lost revenue. So what do we need to do as a service marketing company? Well, one thing we need to do is we want to inspire people to buy, okay? So that's why you'll see those last minute deals, right? You're like, hey, you know, we noticed that our flights to Japan aren't selling very well, so, oh, we have a flash sale to get you cheaper flights to Japan. You know, go to the Olympics or whatever. They do that in order to inspire people, right? So they're doing that to get those seats filled up. You have that. All the things what you'll see is they'll actually try to inspire repurchasing. Have you ever gone to a hotel? I've seen this quite often. You go to a hotel and you, know, you sign on their internet like, hey, if you book your next day while you're here, we'll give you a discount on that next day. So they're trying to inspire another purchase. But in general, what you really have to do as marketers is you really have to plan for those slow periods. That's why like a place like Paris, there's planes going all year round to come here because it's an all year round tourist destination. So no big deal but if you're going to like an island in Greece well those are only really popular in June July and August so what are we gonna do well maybe we only have our flight service there June July and August if someone wants to go there the other times of the year sorry we don't offer that service okay so you might do that so I hope this helps you understand better the differences between service marketing and product marketing in terms of how services are different than products. If you want to learn more, please subscribe to our channel. We put out all kinds of business videos all the time. Uh, or you can go check us out on our ProfessorWalters.com website where you can find all kinds of other videos and marketing tips. Anyway, I wish you all the best. I'll say au revoir from here in Paris. Hey there, fellow marketers, Professor Walters here, and today we're in Parc Monceau in Paris, France. And today we're gonna to talk about are some of the typical service misunderstandings or service failures that companies do have. Because you know what? We do make mistakes as companies, and it does happen, but the thing is we can kind of prepare our contingency plans. What are some typical things that could go wrong? Well, if we know these things go wrong, we can be better prepared for them and kind of improve and unscrew up from these service failures, okay? Now, if you think about some of your more more common service failures that you've bumped into. I mean, we're here in Paris, which is infamous for its bad wait staff. Well, yes, you can have those personnel issues, you know, maybe, you know, there's an attitude or rudeness or just not being very friendly or polite. You do have these kind of things happen. And the thing is, it's not just here in Paris. I mean, Paris people are fantastic. It's just the waiters have a little bit of a bad reputation, but businesses all over the world. I mean, think about it. You catch somebody on a bad day, they can go from the greatest waiter or waitress or salesperson ever to just someone that's just no fun to deal with. So you do have that, okay? So we have those personnel issues we have to think about. And the thing is, some of these personnel issues really, it's not about the person or the personnel themselves. It could be a lack of knowledge. It could be a lack of training. So we have to really think about things. If we see that people are having a problem with the personnel, is it because the personnel don't know what good service is or they're not sure what they're supposed to do because we all have our preconceived notion of what good service is and companies have their idea of good service so we have to train our workers to make sure we don't have those personnel issues so that there's one thing you have to think about another thing you might see where there's some service failures is time delays. I mean, think about it. When you order a pizza and they say it's going to be there in 30 minutes or less, you are super happy if it comes anytime before 30 minutes. At 31 minutes, you're like, this is the worst pizza place ever. I'm going to write a really bad review about them. I hate them. I'm never going to order from them again. Well, you know what? Time delays do actually upset people. And that is a problem with service. We fly a lot. And think about it. If we miss, if one flight is delayed, we can miss our connecting flight. And that means instead of being in Paris, we're spending an extra day in Indianapolis, which is how happened before. So you have to think about these things. Now what firms can do with these time delays, if you think about it, when you order pizza online, they have the tracker, right? You can see that you have put the order in and John is making your pizza now and Rebecca put this pizza in the oven and Miguel is bringing it to your house. You have all those things there, which is, which is nice, but also it helps you feel better about the time. You know when things are. That's why when people get upset with time delays is they just don't know is when are things going to start moving again? So you have to think about that. So time delays can be a big issue. And then of course, there's always the outages. That's when the service is unavailable. Like 
Why is my cable not working? Why is my internet not working? You're happy with your internet all day long until it doesn't work. So when you have those outages, what can we do? And so what companies do for those kind of service failures, you might see they might offer like a rebate or a month free or a discount or something back, but they're always very sorry. We're sorry that the PlayStation Network is down for the day. We're sorry that our app is not working between 3 and 4 a.m. this morning as we do updates. You have these apologies, you have these things in order to help people. So you might see if a service is not available online, they might have a 1-800 number to call and say, if you have an issue during this time, call us right away so we can take care of that. So you can kind of think about those things. But those are some of the more common kind of failures you do see, you know. There's the outages, you know, so you don't have your service. You have time delays and then you have personnel issues. So you do have that. So what can we do to unscrew up even more? How can we do better at these things? Well, the first thing you should know about unscrewing up, it starts with listening to your customers. I mean, people want to be heard. They want to know that the company cares that things aren't working out. That's how you're gonna turn people off if they have an issue and you say, whatever. Well, of course, that's gonna make them more upset and they're gonna write more bad reviews. And they're gonna tell all your friends. I mean, if you ever sit in one of my classes, I will talk about my bad service experiences with companies that were just silly. I'm like, I had issues with at and I've had issues with Comcast. I'm like, come on, why can't you get this done? And why can't you take it seriously? Because I mean, it took Comcast like three or four months to find my house. I mean, I'm like, the box is in my backyard, the cable company, like, no, we had someone go by there. There's no cable anywhere near your house. I'm like, you're not listening to me. There is a Comcast box in my backyard. It says Comcast on it. All of my neighbors around me have Comcast. Like, sorry, sir, there's just nothing there. I'm like, you're not listening. I'm like, do I need to take an ax and chop out the, the box in my backyard since it doesn't work? Well, then all of a sudden they did show up. You know, you got to think about these things. So customers want to be listened to, right? So make sure you're listening to them. Because the thing is, you might find out that there are issues that you don't know about. Because I know sometimes people say customers just like to complain to get free stuff. Well, yes, there are customers like that. But there's also customers that you might learn that, oh, we do have an issue out there. We do need to fix things out there. Like, so for example, with uh, with uh, by our house, you know, they didn't realize that we were a new house that was there. So for them, there was never a house before, so nothing existed there. So that could be why it was in there kind of like data that, oh no, that doesn't exist, when it really was that the thing for all the houses around us was in our backyard. So you do have that, okay? Now, another thing that's gonna help you unscrew up better is to resolve the customer's problems quickly. Look, if you can get things done quickly, do it quickly because the faster it's taken care of, the less time people dwell on things. I mean, think about it. If you make a mistake and you just think about it and think about it and think about it, it just gets worse and worse. So if we can fix it right away and get things back on track, people will stop focusing on the mistake and focus on that you fix the mistake. Because that's the thing is no one is perfect. No company is perfect, okay? And that's one thing you have to realize as a business. But if we can fix our mistakes quickly, that's going to make our clients a lot happier and it's going to satisfy those upset feelings a bit sooner. Now, one thing I really want to stress when it comes to unscrewing up from these service failures is, is one thing you really got to think about is you want to kind of give a fair solution to everybody. It is not always give the customer everything. Oh, the pizza was a minute late, so we're going to give them a year's worth of free pizza. No, maybe you give them a, a, a ticket for $10 off next time, or maybe you give them you know, free breadsticks for the next order, something like that. You don't have to give them everything, okay? Because that's not really a fair solution to you because they spent 10 bucks on a pizza and you're gonna give them 50 bucks of free stuff. That, that's not really fair for you as a business. So you really have to think about these things. Like, let's find a fair solution for everybody. That's why what you'll see is, uh, for example, on airlines, when there is a mess up, like they oversell the flights, which happens sadly too often, they'll always like let people volunteer. Hey, we need a couple people to jump off this flight. We'll give you $500 in airline miles and we'll put you up in a hotel for the night and we'll give you you know, dinner as well. It's like, wow, that's a lot of stuff. Well, yeah, because it's a big convenience. If you don't get to home today, you have to go home the next day. You miss a day of work. You don't get paid. I mean, there's a lot of stuff with there. So we think a fair solution is you will let people volunteer first to, drop, to not fly on the flight and then we'll give them stuff as well to make up for it. Okay, so it's finding a, an equitable solution for everyone. 
And the thing is, by doing these things, we can really increase what we call service recovery, like recovering from our mess ups. And that's why you really kind of want to know is what are our typical mess ups and what should we do when these things happen? You have these things prepared, it makes it a lot easier to unscrew up. And what you'll see is you'll actually have people that, be, that go from being really upset with you to actually being your biggest fans later on because you really you know fixed your mess ups. And I know for me, back in the day, we always had some, we used to get some interesting comments and one person had said, you know, you deserve the same fate as Saddam Hussein. I'm like, wow, that, that that's pretty hardcore, man. And, and then I explained the thing to them and then they ended up apologizing. They were sharing our videos for months after that because they really enjoyed the videos after they figured out what the mistake was. And so you got to realize it's just because you messed up and your, cli or your clients are upset today doesn't mean they're going to be upset forever ever because you can make up. Just like in any relationship, you're not always lovey-dovey. Sometimes you have little issues and you have your little fights. But you know what? If you make up the right way, it makes your relationship stronger, whether it's in a normal relationship a husband and wife or if it's with a client customer or a business anyway I wish you all the best and bye from Paris hi guys Mark here with Walters World and we're in beautiful Savannah Georgia in Forsyth Park there's the fountain right behind me which turns green at St. Patrick's Day and many people turn green that day as well here but that's I don't think it's from the water I think it's from something else they're drinking Anyway, what we're going to talk about today is the GAPS model. Basically looking at, you know, comparing what clients are expecting from companies and their services versus what they actually receive, okay? Now, there's four main kind of gaps that come about. A knowledge gap is one we talk about, a standards gap, a delivery gap, and a communications gap, okay? And so what we're going to do is go through each of these gaps that are in there, out there, and basically look at some ways that we can help eliminate these gaps so our you know our customers will be happier with our services okay now the first one we have is what's called the knowledge gap and this is the difference between what customers expect and what the firm thinks the customers expect okay I mean if you think about it you're going if you're going to Disneyland or if you're going to a hotel you're you're, you're thinking of certain things are going to be there and the hotel may think well I we think they want this this and this and you think, oh no, I think this, this, and this, and there's going to be a gap between the two, okay? Now, if you're looking to go into a high-end hotel, it's like if I'm going to a nice hotel, I'm expecting valet parking, I'm expecting the concierge that will get me tickets for the best shows, I'm expecting, um, I don't know, you know, high-speed internet for free, all kinds of things. And when I don't get these things, no matter how nice my experience is, if there is this gap, this difference between what I expected to have and what I did get, I can be kind of disappointed. And you'll see that in movies. The movie you expect to be horrible and is okay, you think it's great. The movie that you expect to be great and is only okay, you're disappointed. It kind of goes into that. Okay. Now, how do we deal with this when we're a firm? Well, the first thing you need to do is do your market research. Okay. Find out about your customers and find out what are your customers' expectations of their experience there. And realize that their, their expectations will deal with their previous knowledge and their previous experience dealing with your type of service, okay? Also, when you're looking at this, you have to evaluate your own service quality. So look at your service quality. I mean, is it reliable, okay? Are you, are you, get deal, you know, giving the same things again and again? You know, are you responsive to the customers, you know? Um, I mean, are you empathetic to their problems? I mean, are you giving them tangible results? So if there is an issue, you know, the, the remote control isn't working, are you giving them a new remote control or giving them a new room? Something they can kind of hold on to in a way that shows that you're actually trying to do something. You do that, you can help out, okay? But the first one is the knowledge gap. The difference between the what customers are expecting and what the firm thinks they're expecting, okay? Just in general. Now, the second gap is called the standards gap, okay? This is the difference between the service standards that customers are expecting and the service standards that they actually get when they go there. Okay, so if you look at you go to a hotel room, your service standards that you're expecting are you expect a clean bed, you expect no no floaters in the toilet, okay, you expect certain things. Alright? Now to make sure we don't have any different like any problems here, what companies need to do is work on setting up systems so the same standards are kept up all the time. That's why if you go to hotels or if you go to a restaurant, they have that little sheet in the bathroom that says, okay, at 1 o'clock it was checked by John, at 2 o'clock it was checked by Marie, at 3 o'clock it was checked by Frank. You know, it has these things. You set those systems up so the service standards are up to what people are expecting. Also, you need to train your people to, you know, basically achieve those standards, okay? So training becomes a big deal. And especially in service in general, a lot of these things will be dealt with with training. So you can't expect people to know what kick-ass service is. 
if you don't explain it to them because people can have a lot of different definitions of what good customer service is, okay? The third gap in the gap model is what's called the delivery gap. This is the difference between basically the promised service that's out there and the actual service that is delivered to customers. So if you think about it, you know, if you're going to if you're ordering flowers, okay? You go there and you're like, okay, they tell me that they're going to, you know, get my flowers to my mom on Mother's Day. Now, think about it. Your mom gets flowers on Mother's Day. You're a wonderful son. If your mother gets flowers on the day after Mother's Day, you're a horrible son that only remembered after everyone told you what a horrible son you were the day before. So, obviously, there's going to be some issues there. All right? Now, for a company, if there are issues that, you know, what we, you know, what we basically, you know, people are expecting us to do and what we do aren't, aren't linking up, what can we do? Well, one thing you can do is empower your employees, okay? If we're at a hotel and they're not delivering on their promises of, you know, a clean room or a functioning room or a great TV or whatever, empower your employees to let them switch them rooms, okay? Because no one wants to go downstairs and have to go, well, I need to call my manager. Well, you know, where's the manager? Oh, he's on break. He'll be back in a half an hour. Well, that doesn't help me when my kid needs to take a nap or my kid's got a poop and, you know, we need a bathroom and you can't get me into a room. Okay, these kind of things. So empower your employees to be able to make decisions. That will help, you know, shrink in that delivery gap so you can fix things. Okay, another thing is use technology to standardize your, the delivery of your products. That's why ATMs have become so popular. There's no, there's no variability in, in the service. Everything's the same thing again and again. So the delivery, hey, I know, I put my card in, I put my PIN number in, I ask for the amount of money, it comes out, I walk away, we're all happy. Hey, there's no problems with the delivery there, okay? Other things you need to do um, in terms of making sure the delivery of your service works is be supportive of your employees. If they're trying to do things, you know, you, know, you give them the pat on the back, you can do it stuff, have coherent management that's consistently telling the same thing. This is what good customer service is. This is what customer service is. Deliver on that, deliver on that. Well, that helps them know what they need to be doing. Also, if you see one of your employees delivering great customer service, reward them. That's why you have employee of the month and all these kind of things, because then people see, this is what you need to do to deliver the, the services that we're, you know, people are expecting. Okay, and the fourth is the communication gap. This is basically the gap between the, uh, the, the promises that we make as a company and what is actually delivered to our customers. Now, it sounds very similar to the delivery gap, but the delivery gap is more dealing with, you know, the kind of the, um, I don't know, how do you say it, the promise service standards, whereas the communication gap is overall promises that we all are offering people, okay? Now, the thing is, if you look at this, the communication gap, basically FedEx, they, they promise, look, we'll get your, pra your package there overnight, guaranteed. It's going to happen. All right, fantastic. That's great. So you expect it to be there. If it's not, then you're upset. That's why FedEx knows that, hey, we don't want to have this communication gap. Our promise of getting the next day is dependent on everything. Because if we don't deliver that, then no one will ever trust us again. Okay, so we don't want that to happen. So, and that's one of the things, if you look at the infomercials at night for the P90Xs or the, the Weight Watchers or whatever, they'll go through their whole spiel, okay? But what they say is, look, you do this for 90 days and follow the diet, because they show the exercise stuff for most of the half hour. When they mention, oh, and then there's the diet plan you got to follow. Guys, the diet plan is one of the big things that has to happen for you to get those benefits. And that's why you need consumer compliance. You need to let consumers know what they need to do to make sure that the service actually works, okay? And so you don't have this communication gap. Some things you need to do is, one, manage customer expectations. Don't promise them they're going to lose 50 pounds in a month because that's an extreme case. Give them realistic expectations of what can help. That's why they say, okay, you know, you could have these results, but results aren't typical. They show those things. They tell people these things, okay? Also, only promise what you can deliver. If you can't deliver it, don't promise it. Don't say, oh, well, we'll have it to you tonight. If you can't have it there, don't. Say, okay, we'll have it to you in a few days. That's fine. Also, make sure you communicate the service expectations of your clients, what they're going to need. Look, for your guarantee to work, you need to actually use the whole package. You need to follow the diet. If you didn't, then too bad, okay? You need to put all those things out there. Now, when you have these gaps, you obviously want to fix things if things go wrong. So basically, what are some things we can do to unscrew up? How we can, you know, shrink, shrink those gaps between, our, you know, the, deliver, the promises and the not delivered, delivered promises and all these things. Well, one thing you need to listen to your clients. Listen to what their problems are and what they didn't like and what they did like and, and you know, and fix them. 
okay? And when you listen to your customers, you're going to find out more of what's going on so you can find out ways to improve it for their next experience or the next person that comes. Also, the second thing is resolve the problems that you find and that they let you know about quickly, okay? I know I was trying to pay my AT&T bill a few months ago, and I tried to use the automatic system on my phone, and it kept not working, and kept not working, so I kept getting knocked to a person. And the person will try it again. I'm like, I already did it. And they get knocked me back again. And after half an hour of them keep sending me back to people, I said, no, just do it yourself. Finally, they did it, and it took them 10 seconds. Now, instead of me being happy and them fixing it the first time to do it on their own for 10 seconds, they now had me waste half an hour, which on an iPhone, you know, will take your entire battery. This is an iPhone 3, so it's an old one. Okay? But also, now I have a bad taste in my mouth from my AT&T experience. And you look at this and say, man, if they just would have hurried up and fixed the problem quickly, if they could have done it themselves, we wouldn't have these issues. Okay? And the third thing is provide an equitable solution. Okay? Basically, fix the problem and make sure it's you know, fair to them and to yourself because you can't give them the world. You can't say, oh, your remote control isn't working. Okay, we're going to give you the president suite. No. But you can you know, offer them you know, another room, a new remote control. If the TV is that important and they're that upset, give them a discount in your room because the, you don't want to be you know, people upset with your, your service and you're not doing something to make it better, not make it equitable. I know we were driving down here to Savannah, we stopped at a hotel, they were remodeling, the pool was closed, they wouldn't even look if there was a baby bed and they wanted everyone to pay a full price. I'm like, aren't you going to make some kind of concessions here? No. Okay, well forget you, I'm not going back to you to Holiday Inn in Hodgkinsville, Tennessee or Kentucky or whatever. You know, you, you get these things. You don't want that to happen, okay? So, those are some ideas of basically what the gap model is. So the gap, you know, the knowledge gap, the standards gap, the delivery gap, and the communication gap. You want to make sure that these gaps are as small as possible so you have happy customers. And here's the crazy thing. If you actually beat the expectations, you can get customers that will be loyal to you for life. So I hope that helps you understand the, the, map, the, sorry, the gaps model and basically how you can unscrew up in some of these things. Um, it was developed by Dr. Parsu or Professor Parsu. He's got such a long name, you can't actually say it. I have met the man. He's a very nice guy. I hope this video does him justice. Um, but I hope that helps. And uh, if you want to learn more about marketing or business or other things, or hey, visiting Savannah, Georgia, top 10 sites in Savannah, five things you love and hate about Savannah, come check us out at our website at www.waltersworld.com. And we're on Facebook and Twitter, so hope to see you there. Bye. Hello, marketers. Professor Walters here, and today we're here in Santa Fe, New Mexico. And today we're going to talk about our customer expectations. Think about it. Have you ever gone to a movie expected to be awesome and you walked out disappointed, or you went to a movie not expecting much, but then you came out and go, "Wow, that movie was fantastic." Customer expectations really can impact how customers really enjoy your product or are disappointed by your product. And so we're going to talk about today is how do we kind of manage customer expectations so we don't end up with that disappointed customer. But the thing is we have to first start off with looking at is where do customer expectations come from? Well, part of it comes from their knowledge and experience that they've had with our products before. It's kind of like if you know there's a new Marvel Cinematic Universe movie coming out, you've seen the other, you know, 30 movies that are in the series, you kind of know what to expect. Okay, it's going to be family friendly, it's going to be kind of action packed and things like that. And there's going to be superheroes I've heard of, and of course, there's going to be lots of Easter eggs. You kind of expect those because I've learned that from watching other Marvel movies. So you've learned that behavior, they have that previous knowledge. But the thing is, they can actually go and find more stuff out. Have you ever read a review for a restaurant before you went there, or read a review about a movie before you went there? Yeah, it gives you that expectations. What should I look for when they say oh this is that actor's greatest movie ever you may be expecting a bit more than their usual run-of-the-mill movie and the thing is our marketing materials really can influence uh, customers expectations before they buy our products or before they buy our services that's why we use the marketing that's why we have all these things out there but the thing is some of that's out of our control like those online reviews and how their friends talk about our products or other people that have used our products have done that so there's a lot of things that really kind of influence customers expectations in terms of where those expectations are coming from. And the thing is, those expectations will vary depending on the service they're gonna have. I mean, think about it. When I'm gonna go get my taxes done, I expect a certain level of service. Like, look, I expect, you know, I, privacy, right? I expect you to be, you know, professional because you're dealing with all my money and my taxes and I wanna make sure things there, but I don't want anyone else to know what's going on. I'm expecting certain things 
in that kind of service, all right? But also what you have to think about is you also look at the situation that's in there because the situation the customer finds himself will really influence that customer expectation. For example, ever been on the highway and need to use the bathroom? Well, in a normal day setting, no one would ever want to use a bathroom on the highway unless it's Bucky's in Texas. That's different, okay? But honestly, no one wants to use a bathroom at a truck stop or a gas station or anything like that unless you have to go. And the thing is, your customer expectations going into that pit stop, you know, gas station, highway pit stop, highway road stop bathroom is, hey, I, I expect there to at least be a toilet I can I can go into, right? You're expecting that. You're not expecting it to be super clean. You're not expecting super fancy service. You just expect there's a toilet I can go in, right? And so you have that. And so companies know that. That's why if you ever go to a tourist destination, a lot of times the service isn't super great because they know that, hey, there's gonna be another tourist tomorrow. So you kind of expect, oh, I'm gonna get the tourist service. That's why when you get really good service in a tourist destination, you're a lot happier because you're like, oh, I wasn't expecting expecting to be treated so nice in a place that has millions of tourists coming through here. So that's something you have to think about. Now, the thing is, we also have to do our part in managing customer expectations. And a lot of that comes down to our communication, okay? So first thing you gotta do when you're managing customer expectations is don't promise things you can't deliver, okay? You're basically lying to the customer. If you can't get it to them by Friday, don't say I'll get it to you there by Friday because then their expectation is Friday. If you deliver it anytime after that, you're a horrible person. They hate you, okay? And so it's kind of like if you give mom a Mother's Day gift the day after Mother's Day, you're the worst kid ever. But if it's on Mother's Day, when she expects a gift and you better get her something for Mother's Day, then you're the greatest kid ever, right? So you kind of think about that. What are they expecting? That's why you might see airlines these days. They're like, oh, look, we made it in 20 minutes early. Well, yeah, because now a lot of them are kind of padding their flight times for an extra 20 minutes or so. They might be padding their flight times a little bit. So it makes it like the old hour long flight. They give it an hour and a half just in case. So when you get in five minutes early, you're like, oh, we got in five minutes early. This is fantastic. You're so happy. Whereas if they're five minutes late there, you have upset customers. Customers. So make sure you're communicating with them in a truthful way. Don't promise things you can't deliver. Because if you allow customers to believe things that aren't true, they're just gonna be more and more and more disappointed in you, your product, and your company. So that means deliver what you promise. When you're talking to your clients, talk about what you can deliver, be honest with them. Hey, look, we are swamped this week at our at our factory. We cannot get it to you by Friday. The earliest, the earliest I can get it to you is next week, Friday, okay? I can't do it this week, Friday. You have that honesty with them. It really is something they appreciate because then they can count on you. They expect you to tell the truth. That's really helpful. But also that truthfulness, you have to be truthful to yourself. You have to be honest with yourself about those expectations that your customers have on you. Can you really deliver that? Can you deliver what you are promising yourself, okay? And when you're realizing you're promising things that you can't deliver in general, then there's no way your company can deliver that and then the customers get upset too. So you got to think about those things as well. And then there's another thing that I think a lot of people forget about when they look at customer expectations, especially the customers, because customers will get upset about things that it's actually things they caused. Have you ever seen one of those diet commercials online? They show the, the before, <laughs> they show the before and then the after, you know, like, oh, look how, look how much weight Mark has lost. Look how great he's doing. Well, the thing is they always talk about their exercise routine and stuff like that. But if you read the fine print, what they say is for you to have the most success in this exercise program, you also need to follow our diet. And most likely that diet is probably like a 1500 calorie diet. Of course, you're gonna lose weight that way. You need to communicate those service expectations that you as a company have on those customers. Hey, look, if you want this diet program to work, it's not just doing the exercise, it's doing the diet as well and eating the right foods, right? Or if you think about it in terms of your cable company, they say, look, if you wanna get your cable, you want it installed, you gotta be there in that nine to 11 window like we promised, because if you're not there, we can't deliver our service to you, okay? So make sure you're being honest with it, communicating those service expectations on the customer side as well. Then you have a lot better chance of not having any of these miscommunications, therefore where you'll have a better chance of having customers with better expectations of what you're going to be delivering to them and therefore they'll be happier with the services or products that you're delivering okay so i know it's not the most exciting topic out there but it's something important to think about when you're making promises to your customers you got to make sure you're going to be delivering them and you can deliver them otherwise you're going to have disappointed customers and disappointed customers 
they don't come back. Anyway, I hope this didn't disappoint you. If you liked it, give us a like. I appreciate it. If you want to learn more about marketing and business, hit that subscribe button. And we wish you all a great day from here in Santa Fe. Bye. Hey there fellow marketers, Professor Walters here, and today we're here on the beautiful campus of the University of Georgia, and today we're going to talk about is how you can evaluate service quality, because there's a lot of things you have to consider when you want to look at good service versus bad service versus mediocre versus middle, average, above average, when are you more impressed than other times with service? And so we're going to kind of go through our just, just some different criteria you might want to look at in order to evaluate service quality, okay? And the first thing you want to look at is the reliability of the service. Now, reliability of the service doesn't necessarily mean it's always good. Reliability is looking at is, is it consistent? Do they deliver the same type of service over and over again? Can you rely on them to give you a really good meal every single time you go there? Can you rely on them to have really good service at the front desk and stuff like that? This is what you have to think about because if you think about it, you have friends that are reliable, both good and bad. You know, you always have that one friend that's pretty reliable. If you want to have a good time, you go hang out with them. But you also have that one friend that's pretty reliable that if you hang out with them, you might end up in jail that night. Yeah, I got my buddy Mike. Yeah, I always have to worry about that when we go out together. You do have that, but it's that reliability, that consistency. Is it delivering the same thing again and again, okay? Now, the second thing we're gonna look at when we look at service quality is the responsiveness of the service personnel. So how helpful are they or how willing are they to help you when you have an issue? Ever gone to buy shoes and you're like, hey, could you get my size? Yeah, yeah, I'll get to that eventually. Oh, okay, they're not too responsive. I don't know if they're gonna do anything. Versus other places, like if you go to a Von Mar, like, oh, I'll be right back. I don't know what the other sizes because these run a little small. So make sure that I get the extra size up just in case, just for you. You're like, wow, you're really willing to help me. And so you will judge service quality on that just on the basis of their willingness and kind of active way of helping you. So that's another way you can look at service quality. And that kind of leads into the third thing we want to look at is that's the assurances of the service provider. Like how much do you actually believe they're going to do what they say they're going to do? I mean, I've worked with a number of places and had, you know, with my house and other things that they said they were going to do stuff, but how they said it and what they did didn't really leave me with a lot of confidence. Oh yeah. Yeah. Someone will be there later today someone will be there later today. No, no. I would like to know like who that person is, when will they arrive and what should I expect from them? Not, yeah, yeah, somebody's coming. That's not giving me very much assurances that your service quality is very good. And that kind of goes into the amount of knowledge that the service personnel has or the politeness factor that the service personnel has. If they're showing politeness and they show that they know what's going on, that's going to make you feel better about what they're offering. So you're going to feel better about the service quality they're offering to you. And this goes into the next thing. And I like to look at it in terms of empathy towards the client or empathy of the service personnel. Do they feel your pain when something's gone wrong? Do they feel your joy when things are going right? I know in all of our travels, we've had it a lot of times where our luggage have gotten lost and we've seen the people at the left or lost luggage you know, area at the airport and some of them are super empathetic. Oh, I'm so sorry your luggage got lost. We're gonna help you out. We're gonna figure out what it is. Please let me have your, your, your baggage claim number. We're gonna look up and see where it is, find where it is and when we can get it back to you. Like, oh, that's so nice of you. Like you really fit the empathy like they cared. But there's been other times, I remember we were in Chicago once and the lost luggage, the lady in front of us, they lost her wedding dress. And this lady was beside herself. I felt so bad, Johnson felt so bad for her. But then the person that was taking the lost luggage like, give me your ticket. I'm like, could you just say like, oh, I'm so sorry. Could you let me see your ticket so we can look it up? I'm like, she could have been so much nicer. Or just a little bit nicer would have made a big difference. And that's why you're like, you're showing no caring, which means the service level goes down even if you do the exact same thing, because that agent could be friendly and empathetic or mean and not care, but you still do the same thing to look for lost luggage. They look up the badge claim number, they put it in the system and it spits out where it is. It's the same thing. But empathy, showing that kindness can make a big difference in how people kind of evaluate service quality. And then you look at the tangible evidence of service quality. You know, if there's a place that says, oh, we give out the best service possible. And then you go to their store, the store looks like it's falling apart or, or, or the tables aren't clean at a restaurant and stuff like that. Like there's a restaurant that I used to really enjoy and like we care about our customers. But when I go in, the floors are dirty, half the tables are never cleaned off and it makes you go, Hmm, do you really care? Or are you just saying that? Like, 
Prove it to me. Show me some tangible evidence that you are doing a good job. That's why you'll see airlines, you know, like Delta will have a thing like, oh, we were ranked like the favorite airline of Americans or something like that. Or, or you might see where like we won the JD Power Award for customer service. So they're trying to show you some kind of tangible thing showing, look, we are doing good service. We're trying to help people out. We're winning awards for this. Can't you see that? But also, if you think about it, when they have a, you know, lost and found someplace, look, we're trying to help people that lose stuff. We have a dedicated staff for that. Oh, your baggage is going to be delivered to your house because we have dedicated, you know, delivery people that will get it to you. It's like, oh, that makes me feel so much better versus, yeah, it'll show up at the airport. What? Like you, you care about getting my luggage back to me, but I have to come back to the airport? That's, that's not really helpful. And so you kind of think about all these things combined, help people determine what level of service quality they're actually receiving because some of them will have more influence than others and so you have to think about that and that can be on a client by client basis and that's why when you want to have you know good service quality one of the things you have to think about is definitely using the training of your employees using all the technology that's out there automation out there things like that to help give kind of that consistent same service level so people can rely on it and it doesn't hurt to be a little bit nice too so i hope this helps you know a little bit about how you can evaluate service quality if you want to learn more we've got plenty more marketing videos out there thanks for watching and bye from athens georgia Hey there fellow marketers, Professor Walters here, and today we're here in Aruba, and yes, you can hear the waves crashing behind me. And today we're gonna to talk about is basically how you can ensure delivering service quality when you're delivering the value of your product or service, okay? Now the thing is, is when you're looking at making sure you have consistent service quality or good service quality, there's some things you can do to kind of eliminate a lot of these issues, okay? One of the big things it comes down to is training your employees. You really do need to train them so they know what is good quality, what is bad quality, what is good service, what is unacceptable service, because you don't want to have people not sure what good service means in that restaurant, because people want to make sure they get the same level of service every single time that consistency factor and so training your employees so they know this is how you set the table this is how you talk to the client this is how you address them they come in can really help delivering that good service quality okay now another thing that's important with your employees if you want to have this good service quality is empowering your employees giving them the power to make decisions you know that's one of the things I enjoy when I go to certain rental car agencies. If there's an issue, they don't have to say, wait, I need to talk to my manager, but he or she's out for lunch, so it's gonna be about an hour or two before we can get back to you. No, I like it where there's empowered employees who can say, you know what, there's an issue here, we're gonna upgrade your car because we don't have your other one right now. Hey, there's an issue here, we're gonna take care of it, don't even worry about it. They have the power to do things that will satisfy the customer's needs, so that's a really important thing as well. There's so another thing you need to do is you need to provide support to your employees. Because the thing is, if you know your boss is gonna stab you in the back, you're probably not gonna give very good service quality because you're too worried looking backwards to see if your boss is gonna stab you in the back, right? And so by providing support to your employees to you know stick up for them and things, that really makes a difference because then if they feel that their boss has their back and that means they're gonna have, they're not worrying that way, they can focus more on the client. And the thing that helps with that is if you as a manager give consistent messages to your employees. So if you're gonna say, look, quality is job one, quality is job one. You as a manager are showing that quality to your employees, like how you're treating them with quality so they do the same thing. But you wanna have that same message again and again because you don't want one day, oh, we're all about quality. The next day we're all about the customer. The next day we're about saving people money. What are you really for? That consistent message really helps to deliver consistent good service quality. And then of course, another thing you can do for your employees is reward them. Look, if they're doing a good job, you want to reward them. And sometimes that does mean you do have the employee of the month kind of thing. You're saying, look, they exemplify the kind of service that we want to have here. And so we're rewarding them. And maybe it's giving them a, a bonus for that month, or maybe they get a better parking spot for that month, or their picture hangs on the wall something like that that shows people that's the kind of service we want to deliver so emulate that person's service delivery and that can really help and the thing is though sometimes the delivering on service quality 
doesn't always deal with the people. Another thing you might want to look at is technology. And so what you might want to look at is, are there ways we can use technology to improve that quality service experience? For example, maybe instead of having people wait a hundred people in line to check in at the airport, you let them check in on the app if they just have carry on bags, right? Or if you go to the airport, sometimes they have a little kiosk and you just put your passport in and it prints off your boarding pass, it prints out your luggage tag, you put it on, you just walk up, deliver and go. And so technology and also automation could help to deliver that service quality. So I hope this helps you get a few ideas of how you can kind of consistently deliver good service quality. Now, there are tons of other things you can do. And what I want you to do is down below, let's talk about some places that really delivered consistent good service quality to you. So we can you know, give them praise, but also we can learn from other people about the good and the bad. So maybe put the good experiences and the bad experiences and how they could help below. Anyway, I wish you all the best and bye from Aruba. Hey there fellow marketers, Professor Walters here, and today we're going to talk about where do customer expectations come from? I mean, think about it. If you're a service marketer, don't you want to know what your customers are expecting so you can deliver on that expectations? I mean, that's the thing is when I, I'm teaching a class, right? I have to have an idea of what are my students expecting to learn here? What are they expecting to get out of this class? Because if I don't deliver that, they're going to feel like, oh, this class was worthless. But if I do better than that, they'll think, wow, I got a lot more out of this class than I expected, right? And so firms that are in the service industry, whether you are a restaurant, whether you are you know, an, you know, an airline, whether you are an education, whether you are a CPA, right? We have to figure out what these customer expectations are. There's three things I want to kind of focus on when we're looking at basically understanding customer expectations. And the first thing is looking at where do these expectations come from, right? Well, a lot of their expectations might actually come from our marketing materials. I mean, think about it. If you're a college student, you see all these marketing materials Look at all those happy students. Look, they're studying in front of that really cool building. And look, they're, they're playing ultimate frisbee on the quad and stuff like that. that and you, you see all this kind of stuff like, wow, it looks like I'm going to have a good time when I go there. And when you go to that university and you don't see anybody playing frisbee and no one's studying together in front of the famous statue, you have this kind of like, I'm kind of confused. This isn't what I expected. That's why it's really important that you make your marketing materials really reflect the actual service you're going to get. That's why. Have you ever gone to a movie because the preview looked awesome and then you saw the movie and you're like, wait a minute, that preview had nothing to do with this movie. Did I get in the right movie? It's happened quite a few times to me because what's happening is we're marketing a different movie than what's actually being shown. You want to make sure it links up because then people know what to expect. That's why when you watch an Avengers kind of preview, you know what you're going to get, right? Because another thing that's going to influence where these customer expectations come from is previous experience. Why is it we can turn an Ant-Man and a Guardians of the Galaxy that no one really heard of before and turn them into blockbusters? Well, we knew we enjoyed those Avengers movies, we enjoyed those Iron Man movies, those Captain America movies, all those kind of Avenger movies. Well, they've done so well, so I've enjoyed everything else Marvel Cinematic Universe did, so why wouldn't I like this? Our, their previous experience with our movies influences their perception of the next one, right? Kind of like, you know, if there's a new Pixar movie out, what do you expect? You expect to laugh, you expect a good story, and you dang well know you're gonna shed a tear or two, right? Yeah, I mean, it's guaranteed, it's Pixar. I'm like, I'm getting goosebumps just thinking about Toy Story 3 when they're all about to die, oh, and, the, and the claw comes down. See, you get that emotions, right? You, you kind of think about those things. And so that's one of the reasons why, you know, customers have certain expectations, just their previous experience with you. And the thing is, is sometimes they don't have experience with you. Sometimes it could be their preconceived notion. So if I say a campus bar, you have a very different idea than if I say it's a local bar, right? The local bar, oh, they've got, you know, there's Budweiser going and there's some music in the background and it's just people drinking away. But a campus bar, oh, they're going to have the university stuff all over the place and there's going to be games on and there's going to be a lot of young people there drinking crazy stuff, Jaeger bombs and stuff like that. You have a different kind of expectation, right? And so you have to think Think about that. You have to realize to yourself, hey, who we are is going to give people different expectations. And that's why the next thing I want to talk about is realize that expectations will vary depending on the service you're going for. Because think about it. If you're going to be doing your taxes, right? Well, 
if I'm going to a CPA, I'm expecting a different level of service than if I'm gonna to go to the tax place that's in Walmart, okay? They both can do your taxes. Hopefully they will both keep you out from, from getting audited, right? But you have different levels of service you're expecting. So if I go to my CPA to do my taxes, I expect them to find the tax deductions and stuff like that that's gonna help me lower my tax burden. I expect them, hey, if I've got lots of income from around the world, they're gonna know how to make sure it's all set in the right way for the currency exchange rates and stuff like that. Look, I expect certain things things, right? Oh, you're going to have this fancy desk, you're going to have your own office, you're going to have the secretary that's going to let me in and all this kind of stuff. And I also expect to pay more. Whereas when I go to Walmart to do my taxes there, what do I expect? Well, I expect them to get my taxes done, make it simple for me. So it's kind of like the basic kind of stuff. And I expect a little bit less of finding all those loop, not loop, necessarily loopholes, but finding all those deductions and stuff like that. I'm expecting a different thing based on that kind of service we're looking for, right? Because you're either looking for, hey, I just need tax things, or I need like, I need a full financial plan to go along with this kind of tax burden, all right? So you have to think about that. But the thing is, it's not just the service that can influence things, it also could be the situation that you're in, right? I mean, think about it. Would you ever really want to go to a roadside gas station bathroom? No, you wouldn't unless it's Bucky's in Texas, but that's a whole other story. You really wouldn't want to you know, go to the bathroom at a, at a gas station or a truck stop in the middle of nowhere, but sometimes you know, when you gotta go, uh, you, you gotta go, right? And so that situation will dictate, you know what? The level of service I'm willing to accept is gonna be a little bit less when it comes to that situation when you gotta go, right? And so you kind of think about those things. And that's where you'll see a lot of times in big tourist destinations, you don't have the same high level of service as you do other places. That's why Venice, you go to Venice, Italy is fantastic, but when you go to Venice, you don't get the true Italian experience because there's tens of millions of tourists that go through there like it seems like every day. So they, the, the people that work there know that, look, I don't have to be fantastic with my service because you know what? More tourists are gonna show up tomorrow and the day after that, day after that, no matter what we do. Whereas other places at your local restaurants, if you live in you know, a town, they need to get those clients coming back. So then you make sure they're delivering that good service consistently so people come back again and again and again because people are eating in that situation. They're looking for my local bar, my local restaurant, our every Friday night dinner reservation kind of stuff. They're looking for a very different thing than the situation where it is, hey, I'm just on the highway going through. I just need to find a place where I can cop a squat and do my business and hopefully not get any diseases, right? So your level of service you're kind of expecting will differ on the situation you're in. So I hope this helps you have a, a little bit of an idea of how to understand customer expectations a bit better. Now this goes in with our whole discussion about the knowledge gap when it comes to the gas model and service marketing. So check out those videos as well to help you have a better idea of how the gap between what we expect and what, our custom, what we think our customers expect and what they expect are different. It can really help you out. Anyway, I wish you all the best. Bye. Hey there fellow marketers, I know I screw up sometimes, I'm going to guess sometimes you screw up, I mean it's just the way of the world, we all screw up sometimes. And for companies when they screw up, there's some things they can do to kind of unscrew up from their screwed up situations, okay? And so what we're going to go through today is just look at a few things that a company can do to unscrew up. And the first thing you need to do when you have upset customers, when you've messed up, or maybe you don't even realize you messed up, is listen to your customers. Yes, we all have irate customers that just like to complain, that want to get a discount or something like that. And the thing is, the issues they bring up actually aren't always jokes. Sometimes it's actual issues that we might not know about. So you want to listen to those complaints. What are people seeing wrong? Where are we messing up? I know from my videos, people are like, hey, you know, they'll comment down, hey, your audio's off. And I'm like, oh, you're right, the audio is off. What happened there? I'm learning about mistakes that I had by listening to your clients. Because clients do have issues and we can learn from them and we can fix those problems, okay? Because people wanna have their problems heard and they wanna have their problems taken seriously and they want the problems to be dealt with. And if you do that, it's a lot more likely you're gonna unscrew up than if you just ignore them and pretend like they're not there. Because what happens when you ignore someone when they're upset? They just get more and more and more and more upset. I mean, go look at Google reviews or Facebook reviews and stuff like that. Or, or my favorite, going to TripAdvisor, look at the one-star reviews. You'll see those people had a small problem and then someone didn't help them or didn't take them seriously. So then it went from writing one bad review to writing 10 bad reviews on every single website about that hotel. That's why it's important. First start with just listening. And it works in real life too. If you screw up with your girlfriend, your boyfriend, your spouse, your partner, your kids, 
Just listen, be like, hey, why are you upset? Okay, you know what, you're right. I totally did mess up. I got the wrong Hostess cupcakes. My bad. I mean, think about it. You know, this goes a long way to unscrew up. And that's why it's important for the next thing you do to unscrew up and or unscrew up faster is really unscrewing up faster by finding a quick solution that will solve the problem. So if you know something's not working, fix it as fast as you can. Because the last thing people want is for their problem to sit there and not get fixed and not get fixed and not get fixed. And then when it does get fixed, like why didn't you do it that way sooner? Because if you put it off long enough, it seems like that, that good solution at the end is actually the less best solution they could have done. Like, why did I wait 10 weeks for this when you could have done it in 10 days? I know for me with my phone carrier, they have this like, oh, call us up and you can pay on your phone. And so I call it up and it's like, oh, the credit card isn't working. You need to talk to a person. So I'm like, all right. So I call a person. They're like, oh, well, you should be able to use your credit card. Just call them back. I'm like, well, I just called the credit card number and it sent me here. Right well, call them. Just do it again. I'm like, all right. I hang up. I call again. Your credit card won't work. I'm like, all right. So they call the number. So I call the number again. And like, oh, well, well, we'll put you, you should call him. Like, dude, I just called. And then I just called again and it still didn't work. Could you help me with this? Well, we're going to put you on the automated one and you can put your credit card in there. I'm like, dude, I know for a fact you can put my credit card number in and you can do this over the phone. Oh no, we'll, we'll get the system work. Don't you worry. I'm like, dude, I mean, this was a half an hour of me like, dude, just put the number in because the automatic system kept crashing and kept crashing, not working. And then after 30 minutes, the guy's like, all right, well, I guess I'll put your number in. I'm like, why did I waste 30 minutes of my life when you could have just done this in the first place? Quick and easy. That's why it's really important. If you can fix something fast, fix it fast because then people move on to something else. They don't dwell on the problem. And I think what's important is when you fix the problem, what you need to realize is the next thing I want to talk about unscrewing up is giving a fair solution. Now, I'm not saying the customer is always right and give the customer everything they want. Like, oh, you know, I spilled my soda. Oh, well, then you get 10 extra fries. No. What you want to do is give an equitable solution, a fair solution. Oh, there was no, you know, oh, our, our, your food isn't cooked. Your steak isn't cooked all the way through. Hey, we'll, we'll fix that. We'll take that off your, take that off the bill. We're not going to give you the whole bill for free, but we'll take that menu item off there because you already drank six beers and had four other entrees. So I'm not going to give you everything for free, but I will take that off. You got to find something that's equitable because if you just give it away, you know, and they're like, oh, I'll give everything for free. People might take advantage of that for one, but for you as a business, that's not fair because you gave away $200 of free food because you messed up a $10 steak. Does that seem right? The math doesn't work. So you gotta make sure it's fair. And the thing is you have to realize is if companies really try to unscrew up, they can actually turn upset customers into fans. I know me and my Walters World channel. We did a video, we did a, or actually my best economics fact. It's an old, old, old channel I had. And I did a song called Idiota Portuguese, which is like Portuguese idiot, which was made off the American Idiot song. And, and I was just making, you know, singing in Portuguese, doing some stuff and having a good time. A parody video, right? Do gets on there, comments, you deserve the same fate as Saddam Hussein, you can burn in hell. I'm like, whoa, dude, obviously upset customer. I need to listen to him. What is he so upset for? He was upset because he felt I was insulting Portugal because he didn't realize that it was a parody. And so I wrote him back and said, hey, look, I'm not trying to insult anybody. It's a parody video, so we're having fun with it. And then like, that's why I'm like in front of the, the, the telenovelas and I'm talking about the food and stuff like that. And the things that people talk about about Portugal. And the guy's like, wait, you actually really do know a lot about Portugal. And, and I see what you're doing now. Oh, my bad, man. I'm so sorry about that. And he became actually a really big fan when we first started Walter's World. He came on there and was promoting our videos a lot too. So it's weird how you can turn upset customers into actually brand champions if you work at unscrewing up. Unfortunately, a lot of companies will just turn their backs and be like, your problem, pal, not my problem. And of course, then you turn them off forever. I mean, there's been brands that we've loved like there's, there's the airlines we used to fly with all the time and they kept screwing up and they just said, your problem, like, no, you canceled our flights. How is that my problem? I'm confused. And so you have that. So you gotta realize young screw up, you have a better chance they're gonna stick with you if they're a little upset. So I hope this helps you have a few ideas about how you might unscrew up if you do mess up. And the thing is this works for, um, you know, like business relationships and personal relationships as well. So I hope that helps. Anyway, I'll talk to you later. Bye.
Hello fellow marketers, Professor Walters here, and today we're going to talk about is how you as a business can correctly communicate the service promise. Because the thing is, is when we're working with customers, especially in a service industry, we need to make sure that the customer understands the service that we're going to deliver to them so they're not disappointed. I mean, think about it. Have you ever been told, it's the greatest movie ever, or this is the best restaurant in town, and you saw the movie and you thought it sucked, and you went to the restaurant and the food wasn't very good? Of course not. You're disappointed by these kind of things. And so for us, for businesses, we want to make sure we're getting across the correct service promise. McDonald's, hey, look, we are going to promise to be standardized and fast to you. Burger King, your way, right away, right? There's all these things we're doing in order to make sure you have the right expectations when you're coming to our restaurant or coming to our store or wherever, okay? And I think the first thing we need to talk about is when you want to make sure you're doing this correctly is make sure you're managing customer expectations. I mean, you're not promising them the world. Look, we're a fast food restaurant. We're McDonald's. We're fast food. We're cheap. We're going to get you filled up and through the door in and out real quick. That's what our promise is. We're not promising you a filet mignon. We're not promising you that we'll revolutionize your taste buds because you know, you've been at McDonald's, you know not to expect that. But what you do expect, look, it'll be fast, it'll be on time, I know exactly what I'm gonna get and those fries are gonna be dang good, right? And so you have that. Because if you overhype your products, it's more likely that people are gonna be disappointed. I remember 20 some years ago when the Phantom Menace came out, the new Star Wars, they are hyping it, it's gonna be the biggest thing ever, it's gonna make more money than Titanic, it's gonna be incredible. And everyone saw it and they were so disappointed because they expected the greatest thing, greatest movie ever and they got well, The Phantom Menace, so go check it on Disney Plus if you need to, okay? And so you kind of think about those things. And that's why it's really important. You don't make claims that aren't true about your products or services because that's going to set them up for disappointment and you're not really delivering on your service promise because you're promising something you can't deliver. And what kind of goes along with that is don't allow your customers to believe things that aren't true. Because what happens is if you know there's myths about your product or legends about your products or whatever and you don't like say no well actually our product doesn't do this our product doesn't necessarily do that and then people go and buy it and it doesn't do that that it, it's rumored to do they're upset it's really important that you manage the kind of service promise you're putting out there and how people are interpreting it okay that's why it's important you're communicating you're listening you're understanding what people are hearing when you're making your promises of your well your service promise okay and that's why it's really important that you only promise what you can deliver i mean I'm a college professor, so I get a lot of these, oh, professor, I left it at my apartment. I had it in my book and it said, left it at my apartment, or I'm gonna get it to you this afternoon, or I'm gonna get an email to you later today. I'm like, sure you are. Yeah. Having taught for I, many, many years, let's put it that way, okay? I know, students don't get all their work done. I know that, so don't tell me you're gonna get it done if you're not going to. And that same mentality goes with businesses. Don't tell them you're gonna get something done by Friday if you know darn well you're not gonna get done by Friday. All you're gonna do is have an upset customer. So what you should do is say, look, I know you wanna get this by Friday, we are not able to do that. Our earliest we can get it to you is sometime next week. Now, that sometime next week could be Monday or it could be Friday. But telling them that sometimes next week is much better than saying, oh, we'll get it to you by Friday. And then on Friday, sending me an email, oh, we'll have it to you on Monday. There was a delay or something like that, okay? So deliver what you promise. Don't promise what you can't deliver. That's why Bucky's, this, where this is from, this is a gas station chain in Texas. And they are unbelievable. And they promise you the cleanest toilets around. And they deliver on that promise. I mean, you go to Bucky's to go look at all the toilets they have. It's insane how many toilets they have. They've got a lot of toilets and they're super clean, but it's a promise they can deliver on and they do deliver on so people go for that specific reason. And that's why it's really important that when you're making your service promises, be honest with yourself. What can we do? What can we deliver? Okay, because once you're honest with yourself, then it's easier for you to be honest with your clients because you can tell them, hey, look, you know, we're a group of students working on this project. We've got nine other classes going on your project is the top five priority okay i mean i know that i tell companies that work with my students i say look you know you work with college students a lot of them are seniors so they're going to job interviews and they're trying to figure out what's going on in the world they got four or five other classes with tons of projects so your project might not always be the top of their you know agenda and that's important because i'm honest with them to say look 
you're getting college students. You're not getting, you know, Deloitte and Touche coming to, to do your, your marketing review. They're college students that know some marketing stuff. They give you some really good ideas, but I'm not gonna tell you they're gonna reinvent the wheel. But they will give you some good stuff because my students are pretty awesome. And that's why it's really important that you make sure that you communicate the service expectations of your clients. What are they supposed to do? So when companies work with my students, I tell them, look, you're gonna have to do a few emails and a few phone calls and give them some information, the website, you know, you need to you need to call them, you need to answer their emails, because I need you to be a part of this, because you can't get your project done unless you, you know, take part, right? It's kind of like if you look at it in terms of the diet programs, okay? I'm not saying I'm doing any, I'm just saying those dieting programs, they'll show people like before, after right and you you see those you're like wow that really works and they just show people like i'm doing the 90 minute exercise every day and that's what does it for me well the thing is you want to make sure you if you read the like fine print and stuff like that they'll say yes our 90 day weight loss program will work with you in a new way possible and it says like oh 90 days of exercise and then you'll notice it'll say oh but also you have to follow our very strict diet as well because that's how you lose the weight. You exercise so you feel good and then they cut out the calories. So of course you're gonna lose weight. But it's really important that you communicate that to the people using your service, what they have to do. Look, you're not gonna lose weight on any dieting program if you keep eating ice cream and drinking beer. If you cut those things out, which is very sad, you will lose weight, okay? It's kind of like, especially if you eat as much ice cream and drink as much beer as I do. It helps to drop it out, okay? So that's why you'll see th things like your cable company, like Comcast. They'll tell you, if you want to get the service installed at your house, you need to be there between 9 and 11 a.m. on Tuesday. Why? Well, they need you there so they can get in the house to put all the stuff in for the cable to work. So they're communicating to you that, look, if you want our service to work for you, you have to do something for us. Be there from 9 to 11, okay? so. These are just a few things you can do to help communicate that service promise and keep it, you know, legitimate. And so I hope this helps you know what you can do. Uh, we have other stuff like talking about how firms can like unscrew up when it comes to service marketing and all kinds of other things. Anyway, I'll see you later. Um, I'm going to watch my kid play some tennis now. Bye.